Welcome back to our successful events open course. Today's lesson is about audience experience and how to guarantee it. Hit thumbs up if you want more events related content. Make sure you have subscribed to the channel too. Hello there everyone! Event organizer task is tightly related to the audience experience and how they perceive the events. Even if your goal is entirely different, no event will ever be deemed successful if the crowd and attendees don't have a good time. We discussed about it briefly during our big picture moments in our lesson about what is success. When I started organizing events, what I cared about the most was my goal of selling the products after the events and that my events were rated highly. However, I was and still am much more a public interaction person than in fact with planning in detail. And that was where I was lacking in competence. On a scale from 0 to 10, the audience experience bases 8 points on what they are experienced together with other people and the remaining 2 points with small moments, either individually or with close people. Every time you interrupt them from having these experiences and they notice it, you lose points. In my case, because I'm very good at all the overall experience, I easily earn these 8 points and often a 9 in the evaluation. As time went by, I understood that the experience has a lot to do with what they are perceiving, including the moments alone, not only the auditorium, with the contents. In my customer service course, I define customer service as customer service is the feeling of a service being provided, implying that the person has to feel that you are providing a service for them and that you care for them in the end to assimilate that the company's service is good. It's the same with audience experience, but with a small twist. Here's what happens. The longer their immersion in an event, the greater the perception of quality of the experience. For an event to have a high quality score, it's important that people do not have their experience interrupted because they realize they are at an event. There are situations that people are used to such as openings or breaks and moments of choice that they understand they are part of the experience, such as buying tickets at a fair. I say they are used to it because as what is common changes, their expectations and what they accept also changes. For example, events for a younger audience will accept a lot more to put on a badge, accreditation, write their name, find the name on the list, these things. For a more refined audience, they want this process to be very fast with much less tolerance. Don't forget to refer back to my lesson on what's a successful event, for there is some definition of success in the event industry. Time to delve deep into the stuff. Let's draw the big picture here. It's incredible the diversity of research surrounding audience feedback and satisfaction. It's a large field, especially due to the diversity of event categories. This concern with the ex event experience is not exactly new. I've been participating in this debate since I started to professionally work with events in 2012. There is even a huge R name Welcome to the Experience Economy by Joseph Pine, which we will discuss later. But also, the media and various companies are placing a huge weight on it. Customers are demanding for novelty and added value, especially in this competitive market that is events. An article published in the International Journal of Nonprofit and Voluntary Sector marketing makes a point that event producers should ask for feedback because involving the audience in the process can be perceived as part of the experience itself. Another paper published in the International Journal of Events and Festival Management just corroborates that real-time capture and analysis of audience feedback provide a great insight to event producers and planners. There are many ways to approach this subject. This research conducted by the Tilburg University in the Netherlands found four defining characteristics of events. They are in 
inherently personal and subjective. They are responsive to the clear purpose or affordances of external and art stage activities, setting or events. They are also bounded in time and space and significant to the visitor. Another article conveniently tied empowering audiences to measure quality, cites the music director and chief conductor of the Australian ballet. The energy is incredible dependent on what is coming back from an audience. I don't think audiences are aware of the impact they have on a performance. This literature review is focused on the art performances, but I found very interesting. They reviewed the literature on audience feedback and pointed out four specific indicators of the audience experience. These factors contribute to the audience evaluation of the quality of a performance. These are knowledge, risk, authenticity, and collective engagement. Knowledge is regarding the audience's understanding of the topic they are watching. Risk is the anxiety linked to the possibility of gains and losses in attending the event. Collective engagement is how individuals perceive the general perception of the crowd if they're engaged with the performance and others. Intensity is more related to art events, but is a category involving a form form of truth in within the performing arts events to directly quote the article. One article by the Université Sauvoir Montblanc in France listed some characteristics of the venue that may impact the audience experience, which is an interesting view. The venue can have a direct impact on the experience due to its functional structure, aesthetic dimension, escapist dimension, or its social interaction dimension. There was a survey conducted in Ireland across various events to assess what they value in events for their evaluation. Personal relevance was rated as extremely important. Both engagement and surprise were equally rated to be somewhat important. On the other hand, learning and novelty resulted as not at all important. Factors with negative impact on the audience experience were overcrowding and noise, waiting time and weather conditions. Finally, maybe one of the most influential articles in my experience, Welcome to the Experience Economy, published on the Harvard Business Review by Joseph Pine. There is a lot to be taken from it, so I strongly suggest the reading. Cool. Overall, Pine claims that companies make an experience when they engage with the customers in a personal and memorable way. He distinguishes the experience economy from the other economies by eight attributes and that we can design experiences using five approaches in our plan. I'm gonna draw a lot from Pine's remarks in this lesson. These five approaches are think the experience, harmonize impressions with positive cues, eliminate uh, negative cues, mixing memorabilia and engage all five senses. What affects your audience experience negatively. Your role as an event organizer is to think about how to make the experience more fluid with the least number of interruptions or that they are smoother and that your audience spends more time enjoying it then realize, oh, I am at an event. It's like watching a movie. Every time you realize that you are watching a movie, either because suddenly the movie stopped too low due to unstable internet connection, or someone has called you, or because you are thinking, wow, this movie is too long, or you had paused to go back because you didn't understand a part. All of this is called immersion breaking. In the end, it doesn't really matter if things went wrong at your event or went as planned, of course. If a lot of it happens, you have a hard time dealing with situations. What really matters is what your crowd has access to. If they don't notice that things are wrong, the audience experience won't be affected at all. That's why it bothers me so much when speakers say, oh, I'm late with time, I'm gonna go fast here, or I was supposed to have a slide here about X, but I don't know what happened. Oh, there won't be enough time to say everything that I have to talk about. Because that makes clear to the audience what is wrong. And even if they are were not aware of it, there are a lot of things that the organizers also do wrong, such as running around, apologizing to the audience for something that they didn't even notice, 
are agglomerating around something that wasn't planned, drawing attention to it. So there are some mechanisms that you can put in place to prevent this immersion break or do it subtly in your event. The first point, it is normal to have transitions in your event, warnings or protocol situations. In my experience, it is better to group the warnings present them in a more playful way and create distractions. For example, accreditation does not have to be tedious. Organize your attendees by numbers. When it's their turn, a teller calls them to the counter to be served. Then you can propose activities in the hall while people wait. Plan some interaction between the guests. Make your events more Instagrammable, especially during waiting times by setting up backdrops in scenery, have music, noise, sociability. For the announcements made on stage, I have two ideas. Either you work grouping the announcements at a convenient time, especially around the time that it's relevant, or do it in some playful way. Here's what happens. I have already tried several formats, like making several notices throughout a session, adding a monologue of instructions, handing a leaflet to people, printing on the back of the badge, uh, notifying during accreditation, etc. What showed the best results is when those remarks became part of the content. It helps in the retention of information, audience doesn't experience this interruption and follows the flow in a fluid way. There are many tips of ideas that you can implement in your events, but in the end, you always have to understand your reality, what you feel comfortable doing and how your audience will react. Another mechanism you can have to improve your audience experience is having people on the team with specific roles. I like to have a snitch, a customer service and a jack of all trades. Or Jill. I will explain these functions. The role of this niche is to be a quality control. They have an eye for detail, know how everything should be according to the plan, and have a critical sense of whether something is wrong. Their job is to report errors. They should not be identified because they should not be sought by the public to resolve situations. The second role, customer service, is to work closely with the attendees. This is a relational person properly identified in that every attendee can go to report a problem or more questions. They gather these situations and pass them on to the stench. This way, these two always know what is happening, even so that the customer service can inform to the audience the status of certain issues. Sometimes a person from the event can come and report that there is a water leak. If these two have good communication between them, the customer service will answer, we are aware and the building maintenance personnel are on the way. Cool? The third function is the jack or jill of all trades, usually a dual, a liberal. They act to direct the situations pointed out or even solve them. They are also not identified to not have interactions with the audience. If there is a leakage, using the previous example, the snitch will suggest a course of action to the jack of all trades, who will go to the building management to request a maintenance person, or they will call a plumber, or they will fix it themselves. It may seem like a lot of people, and if you think about the flow of information for the snitch, from them to the jack of all trades, it may sound bureaucratic. And in fact, it is. If you're organizing an event for 200 people or less, for larger crowds than that, I already recommend thinking about this structure. For the most cases, these roles are only for the day. So I usually have these people working in other roles before the event, so you don't have to worry about building a huge team. There are certain roles that have no workload during the day. There is no need to have people solely dedicated to this for events smaller than 500 people. You can have the host, accreditation, salespeople all acting part-time as snitches, for example. In these cases, my recommendation is that the information is passed on by the customer service. These differentiations are important because the snitch 
has to be present to make a list of priorities. Obviously, uh, the snitch can take certain actions too. If the trash bin is full, they may well solve it. Now, the biggest difference between a liberal and a snitch is for situations that demand a dedication or when they have to go elsewhere. Look, what I want you to leave this lesson with is knowing that, that the important thing is to keep your audience focused on the event without realizing incidents have happened. If something happens in front of them, treat it like it's nothing, unless it's serious, obviously, and move on. Over time, you will acquire this ability to improvise. As we say in my hometown, better than that, just why is that? Recap what we saw in this lesson. What is the audience experience at the event? How can we as event organizers influence it beyond the planning and content itself? Roles and functions that we can place during the event to improve the experience of your audience. Cool? Make sure you subscribe to my channel to follow the lessons, like the video if you think it has helped you, and share it with your colleagues or co-workers. It will help me a lot. Always look both ways. See you in the future.